So the 2024 Wrangler is finally hitting dealerships and getting into the hands of consumers. And with that, we're starting to already see on the internet pictures and video of what this new rear axle actually looks like on the Wrangler Rubicon. Now, there's a lot of controversy on good versus bad, and we're about to jump into that. Welcome to Mud Tire. This is a Tech Talk. So if you've been living under a rock, then you may not know that the 24 year model Wrangler has got a refresh coming out for it. And that includes the front grille being redesigned. They've moved away the antenna for the FM radio and they've incorporated it into the windshield that's highly breakable. And the biggest one that everybody's actually been looking forward to, a new rear axle. Now, just a heads up, this new rear axle that's supposed to be big and great, only comes on the Rubicon Wrangler. It is not available on the Sahara or the Sports, and as of right now, I am not seeing it available on the Gladiator. We're gonna get into that one a little more in this later on. Now, what is this rear axle? Because you may not know. Well, they finally came out with a full float rear axle for the Wrangler. Now, if you don't know what a full float axle is as compared to a semi-float rear axle, then I'll break it down to you really quick in a dirty, quick breakdown. See, a semi-float axle looks a lot like this. This. This is a semi-float rear axle shaft out of a Wrangler. You can see in this design that the bearing is pressed onto this axle shaft and it bolts into the end of the axle housing using this flange. Now, over here on this side, your wheel, your rotor, your, your entire brake assembly goes over here. Now, what this means is that a semi-float axle is pulling double duty on the back of a vehicle. It holds the weight of the vehicle on this bearing, which is on this shaft, and it does the duty of acceleration and deceleration through the end of this flange. Now, this is a bit of a problem when you start off-roading and adding larger tires, which is technically a larger lever to bend the end of this shaft. What Jeep is saying is that they have decided to come out for the Rubicon Wrangler, a full float axle. I'm sure that made them happy. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. A full float axle is usually seen in things like heavy duty pickups because they are able to handle more stresses and more load. You see, a full float axle looks a little more like this. Now this is out of an F-250's rear end because this is a full float axle. You see how there's no bearing on the end of this? That's because the bearing is held in a separate housing on the axle that does all the work of holding up the weight of the vehicle. This shaft only has to do the single duty of rotational force. That means that you have less stress on these shafts and less likely for breakages. So what does that mean for the Wrangler Rubicon that's supposed to be getting this new full float axle? Well, this means that when you want to run those 40 inch tires, you can run them safer and less likely to break something in the rear end of your vehicle. This means they're able to carry more weight in the vehicle. This actually means they're able to even tow more because this Wrangler is actually boasting a larger payload capacity and towing rating. So that's the benefits of a full float axle. So everything's sounding perfect. It sounds amazing, right? Well, on the internet, there's a lot of backlash about this for two reasons. One, there's a large mass of people who believe that the only true one ton comes out of a heavy duty pickup. They don't believe that they're able to actually produce a heavy enough off-road capable axle for the rear of this Jeep. They're naysayers. They, they, don't, they don't see it coming to life. And I will say there is some weight that's carried with that because Dana has had a rough time with the JLs. There's been all kinds of issues coming up with bearing problems, locker issues. Um, Jeep and Dana have not had a good time with this Wrangler. It's just been a little problematic. So I can understand why people would come to the table with their doubts on this new rear axle. And the other thing they think about, which kind of falls into the first one now that I think about it, is really that they just don't believe it'll be a strong enough axle in general to be capable of full float capability for the price range that they're gonna have to sell it. But what I wanna do is we're gonna look at some video that I found online where someone has actually taken apart their new Dana 44, and we're gonna look at how this thing's actually put together. So now I wanna look at the composition of how this actual is actually made. And to do this, I'm going to start by looking at Motor Trend's website. Uh, I'll show you here on the screen. 
So looking at what they've got here, it looks like a cutaway from a unit bearing. A unit bearing like you would have on the front of your Jeep all this time. And unit bearings tend to be pretty strong as long as they're a beefy enough model to handle heavy loads, then I don't think this could be a huge issue, but this is different from a heavy duty one ton axle. You see, heavy duty axles incorporate what is a large hub mounted over a spindle, which is basically a smaller tube coming off of the end of your axle tube housing. And that hub mounts with bearings over that spindle and that's where all the weight of the vehicle rides on. This is a really robust way of building an axle but it's also a lot heavier and it's a lot beefier. So, so I'm not surprised to hear that they're likely not going to be going with that unit bearing setup. And from this picture here, you can see that they had the expectation that they were gonna be using more of a unit bearing design. So looking at this, it also looks like they've incorporated more of a taper bearing design instead of going back to maybe something like their rollerball bearings that they had been using in their axles for a little while. I'm not exactly sure where all you can even incorporate that ball bearing bearing style uh, bearings, but I do know they were having some issues with those. So I think it's good that they're actually going to back to a more tried and true taper bearing here on a unit bearing assembly. So that gives us an idea of what we should be looking at. Now, here I'm gonna go look at a YouTube channel where someone has actually taken apart one of these 24 Wranglers rear ends. And huge shout out to Poots Garage on YouTube. He's allowing me to look in here and comment on his video that he did. Big thanks to you taking the time to tear your Jeep apart just so we can have an inside look. So right here you can see that he's got the rear end pulled apart and laying on the ground. And you can see here the brake assembly is attached to, of course, a unit bearing like we expected. And that unit bearing is four point mounted to the rear axle and there's no built in shaft into this unit bearing. It's, it looks like it's a separate unit. It slides in and out, it's splined. So that that's a good thing to hear that they didn't find some crazy way to incorporate your axle shafts into the unit bearing because that would be just horrible if you had a unit bearing failure or an axle shaft snap and then you have to buy an entire assembly. So I'm glad to see they did this. I haven't seen in his video a good side shot of just how thick this unit bearing is, but considering the fact that they've been able to raise the payload on the vehicle, the tow ratings, and looking right here just from this angle, I'm thinking this is probably going to handle a 40 inch tire, no problem. I definitely wouldn't say consider running 42s, 43s, but I, I honestly believe we've had so many Wrangler owners that have wheeled pretty aggressively with 40 inch tires on a semi float axle with limited failures that I think this assembly will do just fine. Okay, so looking at this, we can see that the unit bearing is what they're gonna actually be using to hold up the weight of the vehicle in the back of the Jeep. Really awesome. And it looks like they're going to be using an O-ring design to actually seal the rear of the housing. Really cool, I like this because that means that instead of using like a paper gasket, that could be problematic because if you tear it apart and try to put it back together, Lord knows these things love to leak like that. Whereas a O-ring style, I'll show you my full float rear axle shaft actually uses from the factory an o-ring around the end of the shaft on this these shafts have been in and out of this jeep so many times i can't even count how many and i'm still using the same o-ring with no leakages so with proper installation, that O-ring will last a very long time. And if you have issues on the trail, like you snap a shaft, you need to pull this thing apart, you know that that is still gonna be a useful seal when you put it back together. So I think that's a really good positive. Now, let's move forward, because I wanna look right around 15 minutes here, you can see that he's actually giving us a closer look of the shaft. It's a splined shaft and it's gonna be double splined on each side because as standard, your differential is going to have to have splined inserts where you slide it into the differential. So we know it's gonna be splined on each end and I can't see from a straight on angle where we can count the splines on this, but just from looking at the size and working with so many in the past, I can honestly say that 
I can almost guarantee you this is a 32 spline shaft. So I think that'll be perfectly fine for people up into the 40s for moderately aggressive off-roading. There is gonna be a little bit of possibility for snap shafts and that is what it is And when you start running 40s and you actually want to rock crawl, especially if you're heavy on the gas pedal and you like to bounce it up the trail. I mean, you, you know what you're asking for. And he does mention a couple things in his video. He points out the fact that this tapers down here right at the splines. And I do see that, but at the same time, I believe that this isn't so much a bad thing. I believe what we're really looking here is the fact that they have thickened up the middle of the shaft so much more to help make it more stable. And the reason I think this is because my 10 factory axle shaft here now, this is a 32 spline, and you can see on this one, this thing's actually pretty beefy for a 32 spline shaft, but you can see that they actually tapered this one as well, and this is a Chromoly aftermarket 10 factory shaft. I got lucky enough to actually meet and talk with a Dana rep at a car event where we talked about axle shafts in the new Wranglers, and we were talking about the point of moving up and upgrading to beefier shafts. And he actually explained something really interesting to me. And he was telling me that Dana's new standard for axle shafts is chromoly. It's not an upgrade anymore. It is, he says that chromoly is not enough of an offset in price to not go ahead and incorporate it into their axle shafts today. So basically what he was saying is every shaft that they use in their axles in today's market is a chromoly shaft. So if that is correct in this application, then I believe you're gonna have a very resilient 32 spline shaft in the back of this Rubicon. All right, so I've talked about a bunch of the benefits here of what we're seeing in this new design, but I do wanna talk for just a minute about negatives because there are some. There's always gonna be negatives to go with the positives. The biggest thing I see right now is the fact that this is such a new design, a completely new axle. It's probably gonna be a long time until we see replacement parts for these starting to stock shelves. So if you wear out a unit bearing, it's probably probably going to be difficult to get a replacement for a little while. As well, if you want to upgrade from a 32 spline to a 35 spline shaft, you are probably going to be on a large waiting list until East Coast, Dana, or Yukon, Revolution, somebody comes to the market with a 35 spline axle shaft and unit bearing to go with that. Because if you think about it, if you're wanting to upgrade your axle shafts for, to a larger spline count, now you not only have to upgrade your rear differential, you also have to upgrade the differential, the shaft, and a unit bearing assembly. And all of that has to work properly with the JL's electronics because we know that the tone ring, I guarantee is gonna be inside that unit bearing. So one more thing to consider. Now with that con, I also do see a pro of the fact that if you snap a shaft on the trail, two things, carrying a replacement shaft is now gonna be so much of a smaller footprint in the vehicle because you're not gonna have that large flange to stick out. I believe that manufacturing these without that flange is going to be a lot cheaper. And I believe that if you snap a shaft on the trail like this, you are most likely gonna be able to slide that shaft out, unbolt that entire hub assembly, slide the shaft out, put the hub assembly back together, and go keep on going down the trail. You can actually pull the entire shaft out, put your wheel back on with the rear hub assembly, and you are good to keep getting down the trail back to your trailer, hopefully. I think there's a large range of people that this is right for. So. Most people who are gonna be buying a Rubicon, a lot of them actually do have the expectation of doing a bunch of off-roading in the future. But if you're one of those guys that you want to run 38s or 40s and you want to do that mild to moderate rock crawling and not just trails, then I think this is going to be amazing for you. I don't see a downside. But most of the naysaying online is from the hardcore rock crawl community who is saying that this is not a strong enough rear axle to be doing hardcore rock crawling. And yeah, you're sort of right, but is the Rubicon 
even meant for you if that's the case because if you're one of the hardcore rock crawlers then we already know you're going to be taking those bumpers that come with the rubicon off as well as the rock sliders the skid pans you're not going to be using the rock track in most applications i think that this was never meant for that one percent rock crawler in the first place but there is a larger application now that the rubicon wrangler is good for so i think this is great now the very last thing I wanna talk about is the Gladiator, because as of right now, I do not see on any specs that this new full float rear axle is available for any of the Gladiators, including the Rubicon. And this blows my mind. I don't understand that because, but I don't want to go on a rant about the Gladiator just yet. We'll save that for later. So with that being said, I want you to go in the comments and let me know, am I right or am I wrong? Is there something that you thought of that I didn't about this axle? Maybe there's something you know about this axle that I don't. Write it in the comments. Let me know your thoughts. Guys, I hope you have a great day in the shop and I will see you on the trail.